As a part of our new digital education program, we're starting a new video and audio podcast series called Cornell Marines Digital Learning Podcast. My name is Rory McNish. I am Cornell Cooperative Extension Marine Program's Media Specialist. And I'm Mark Capolino, Cornell Cooperative Extension's one of our marine educators. This week's show is all about alewives, a local fish that's migrating back to our bays and streams from life in the open ocean. So enjoy the show and be sure to share our digital learning sites on the web and Facebook and with friends and family. Good morning, Mark. Fine is kind. What was that? Was that, a, was that Gloucester slang? It sure are, are, was. Are you a Gloucester guy? Well, not exactly, but I did spend uh, 10 years in Gloucester in 1982 okay. and uh, did whale research and uh, enjoyed my time there. All right. I've been to Gloucester many times. I've had, uh, we've got family up there and uh, brought the kids to camp. And so uh, I have heard that expression numerous times. Now you've been an educator with CC for 27 years. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Time sure flies. It doesn't seem like it's been 27 years. That's for sure. Now what, what's your, uh, what do you mainly do for, for CCE? Well, as a Marine educator, we wear multiple hats. Um, one of our biggest programs is that we work with schools around the county. Uh, mm -hmm. We have programs we go at schools, for example, and bring um, live animals like horseshoe crabs and sea stars. Uh, we actually also have schools come to the marine lab uh, in Southold okay. for their field trips in uh, May and June and, and sometimes in the fall. And then in the summertime, we run uh, various camps uh, at the site. Okay. I uh, hear that your favorite topic is about sharks. Yeah, I've become fond of sharks over the years. Okay. Um, they're very interesting animals. And uh, during the summertime, we have a special week. We call it Shark Week in the summer camp. Uh, and we actually even dissect sharks with the older kids. Sounds cool. Now, when I'm out there uh, doing my job, you know, photographing and videotaping you guys, I hear kids call you Mr. C. Is that okay if I call you that today? Yeah, sure. That's fine. All right, Mr. C. <laughs> All right. So let's get our first show going. So before we talk about alewives, I'd like to hear a true story that I know that you have. Yeah, sure, Rory. Um, a lot of times when I go into the classrooms, I introduce myself as a Mr. Capolino, but I tell the students, um, for the short amount of time I'm going to be here, you can call me Mr. C for short, and that's how I got the name Mr. C. Mm -hmm. But I was in a kindergarten class uh, a few years ago. I don't remember how many, somewhere in Suffolk County. And a lot of times we talk about marine life, I'll start off the presentation by asking the students who can name mm -hmm. some local marine life plants or animals uh, that live around Long Island since we live on an island surrounded by water. So kindergartners are always excited. They're jumping up and down and raising their hands uh, and I'm pointing to them and I'm getting answers like whales and dolphins and turtles and seals and fish. And then there was this one kindergartner in this class was so excited I had mm. to pick and I don't remember if it was a boy or a girl so I pointed at the kindergartner and said okay can you name a plant or an animal that lives in the waters around Long Island and the kindergartner said fish sticks <laughs> well I love fish sticks but I've never seen them swimming around in our local waters that's for you so let's talk instead about alewives okay Mr. C what is an alewife Sure. Uh, alewives are an important fish at this time of the year. Uh, mm -hmm. They're a small fish. Uh, they're silverish in color, sort of darker on the top, like many fish are for counter shading. And as an adult, they get to be about 10 to 12 inches long and weigh about a half a pound. Okay. Now, uh, isn't the osprey very fond of the uh, alewife? Yes. At this time of the year, you may see an osprey uh, catching an alewife. So, Mr. C., what do alewives look like? Well, as I said before, they're small, uh, dark on top uh, and lighter on the bottom. And one distinguishing, well, two distinguishing characteristics is they have a very forked tail. I'm going to put a, a picture up on the screen. Uh, is this an alewife? That sure looks like an alewife to me. Okay. And in the front of the body by the head, uh, behind the gills on uh, the adults, uh, many times you can see this uh, black dot or circle. Mm -hmm. uh, they sat right behind the gills and they belong to the herring family. So they're a type of a herring. They call them river herring. Now, um, what you kind of talked a little bit about, um, the alewife itself. Um, what's their goal? What are they, what are they doing? Where are they going? Yeah. Well, this time of year, they're actually coming from the ocean. Uh, this is the adults. Mm -hmm. Um, alewives are actually 
born in freshwater streams and rivers and tributaries. Uh, some of the salmon, um, most people think of salmon uh, that migrate from freshwater to the ocean and migrate back. So in our local area, uh, our alewives uh, range uh, in the United States is from Georgia all up to Maine. Wow. And this time of year, uh, okay. They'll travel uh, up small streams and rivers, as I said, to the females will lay their eggs and the males will uh, fertilize them. So um, how many eggs do they lay? 250,000 eggs. 250,000. Holy mackerel. That's a lot of eggs. <laughs> yeah, well, they have to lay a lot of eggs because obviously um, <clears throat> when they survive uh, after they're hatched, uh, they're food for lots of uh, animals in the food chain. Okay. You know, if all of them survived, we'd be overrun with alewives which obviously isn't the case. What do alewives eat? Well, after they hatch, uh, they'll swim around in their local little tributary in the freshwater, and they'll feed on uh, plankton, specifically zooplankton, which are more animal-like than uh, plant-like. Okay. Uh, they'll also feed uh, on little tiny shrimp and copepods uh, that they can find in the water, which is a type of a zooplankton. Okay. And uh, I got a question for you. Who eats the alewife? Oh, they're food for lots of things. You already mentioned the ospreys. Mm -hmm, right. uh, as they get larger and migrate down, certainly uh, in the freshwater, uh, freshwater uh, fish that are larger than them will eat them. Uh, when they get onto the open ocean, uh, they can be fed on by uh, larger fish, for example, like striped bass, love alewives, uh, bluefish, uh, up in, we talked about Gloucester before, cod and mm -hmm. haddock will eat them. Okay. Uh, even seals will feed on them. Any other mammals? Yeah, when like they're uh, the along... I'm sorry. Yeah. When they're along the streams, um, right. they can be fed on by raccoons, uh, foxes, uh, can eat them as well. So that seems to me that they're a very important species, a part of the, you know, as a part of the marine ecosystem. Is that right? Well, every species is important in the ecosystem and uh, here right. in our example. Yeah, sure. They're food for lots of different types of fish and other marine and other mammals, as you said. Mm-hmm. Now, are they um, like a endangered species or threatened or, you know, what's their, what's their status now? Well, over the years, uh, alewives have been used, actually humans actually use them uh, up in the uh, New England area. They actually would catch the alewives when they come up in the spring uh, and they would actually use them for bait for lobster traps. Mm -hmm. um, some people occasionally would eat, even smoke the alewives in the past. So they are actually uh, have been depleted uh, from some harvesting, but probably the biggest factor is uh, over the years since the colonial times, many small dams have been built along streams and tributaries okay. uh, for grist mills. Remember the old days you had the yeah. corn or the oh, yeah. wheat, they would grind it, all right? Yeah. Uh, and then obviously other smaller dams are used for building ponds on streams. And when the alewives get there, they get stopped so they can't get into the areas where they want to go. And I know that in one, one area is Grangible Park for sure. Um, and there's been a lot of, uh, lot of work uh, done up there. What, what, do they, what do they do to correct that situation, Mark? Mr. Well, C. When, uh, when the <laughs> alewives um, spend as an adult about five, seven years in that time period uh, in the open ocean. Uh, okay. And then when they come back to spawn, they actually come back to the same river that they were born in or a tributary. Right. Uh, so if there's a dam there, uh, they get blocked uh, and they have to uh, stop in that pool and maybe not be a, a real good place to lay eggs. So their population has decreased uh, due to that factor. So in one, a lot of places, they've either taken small dams that aren't being used anymore and, and torn them down so the fish can have access to more area to spawn, or they put in some things called fish ladders. Every year, Cornell Cooperative Extension's Marine Program Director, Chris Smith, and his staff, as well as Jim Miller of Miller Environmental, would start the process of installing the fish ladder. Jim would, he'd bring a big crew and run heavy equipment needed to install it. And uh, we certainly can't forget about a gentleman named Bob Conklin. He was a retired uh, Riverhead science uh, teacher, and uh, he'd actually bring the kids down and they'd, they'd scoop the alewife uh, from one side and, and put them on the other side so that they could go up and spawn. Um, Bob was also very influ influential in uh, helping to create the Peconic River Fishway Project, and that was a committee to overlook the installation of the fish ladder. So uh, there had been some talk um, over the years of putting in a permanent fish ladder because of the, the process of doing it was so intense and so, you know, 
what it was a big commitment on uh, both uh, CCE and um, Miller Environmental, Riverhead Town, and all these entities that got together to do it. Um, they decided to create a permanent fish ladder. And with much effort of permitting and um, funding and um, just going over lots of hurdles, uh, the Peconic Estuary Program uh, raised money enough to, uh, to start that process. And the rock ramp was permanently installed and it's working really good to this day. Mark, I'd like to introduce Dr. Matt Sclafani, our coworker of ours, who is now overlooking CC's alewife projects and implementing uh, the studies on them. Uh, this clip I produced a few years ago. And the alewife is a critical species in this estuary and all the estuaries. And in fact, in the past, they used to be the dominant filter feeding fish, the alewife, the menhaden, all the herrings. Uh, they were tremendous filter feeders of the estuaries, possibly contributing more to filtration um, in the ecosystem than even the bivalves that once were in here. The fish ladders have tremendous um, benefit to other species than river herring. Uh, American eel um, can utilize them. Uh, there are trouts that we're hoping we use them. We, we're only just on, beginning to understand what other fish can utilize them with the video camera. We might see white perch in some of these systems. We've seen catfish utilize them one in the Carmen's River. Um, and we've also, uh, you know, expect to see many of the stocked fish that the DEC put in, like the, the rainbow and the um, brown trout are utilizing it. Uh, but for the natural diadromous species, we're hoping something like the white perch might use it as well in the sea run brook trout. So we'd get lots of gains for putting, you know, simple restoration to work. It's, it's good talking to you about alewives and their importance to the marine environment. Guess what we're talking about next week? I heard a rumor we may be talking about clams. We're definitely talking about clams. What kind of clams? Oh, you're talking clams. We're yeah. talking clam chowder. There we go. Another uh, Gloucester reference. Yeah, it's so, a uh, good, it's a pretty good clam chowder in those days, that's for sure. Oh, yeah, me too. I'm telling you. And, and you know, the thing of it is my brother-in-law was a chef there, and uh, it's the funniest thing. He, they don't like Manhattan clam chowder. They don't call it clam chowder. They call no, it they don't. Like clam soup or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so right. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that conversation, though, Mark, talking about clams and uh, what Cornell Marine Program is involved with right now with the uh, the new Long Island uh, shellfish restoration project that's going on. That's right. To raise millions and millions of clams and millions of shellfish. Right now, we're working on the clams, so uh, we'll bring that to you next week. So, uh, all right. Thank you, Mr. C. And uh, um, we'll end it here. Yeah. And I just want to say that this podcast is a part of a digital learning initiative here at Cornell Cooperative Extension Marine Program. If you want more information and more materials, please go to our website at www.ccesuffolk.org forward slash marine. Look for our digital education initiative link on the lower left part of the page. As I looked yesterday, there's more like references to the digital learning page as well. So if you go there, you'll definitely see it. Now we've been putting together some teacher and student resources, art initiatives, quizzes, and some really good and informative videos. So see you next time on Cornell Marine's Digital Learning Podcast. I'm going to go have some chowder for lunch. All right, me too. All right. <laughs>